Hi, everyone. Well, today we're doing um, a different uh, topic than yesterday's topic, which was a little more serious. Well, this is serious, true, and not serious, the blend. But we have the author of Maddie, Milo, and Me, and her name is Ann Abel. Say, want to say hi? Hi, Ann. Hi, everybody. It's nice <laughs> to be here. Oh, lovely for you to come. And she has shared her intimate journey through love, loss, and self-discovery in her memoir. Now, you all know that I wrote a memoir, my first book, called Raised by Wolves, Trapped by Demons. And it's a bestseller on Amazon and Audible. I never thought that would happen. And uh, the wolves were my parents. <laughs> the demons were the men in my life <laughs> until I straightened up and found the right path. But a memoir is um, an interesting way of writing because you don't have to imagine things. You experience things. So it's different. Um, you grew up in an abusive home, I believe. And sure. I, did, I did too. I did too. So I relate to that in your book. And um, it led to severe depression. And I also had depression and anxiety when I grew up, but I self-medicated with alcohol. And by doing that, um, of course, it grew into an addiction. And um, I was an alcoholic for 15, 20 years of my life. And then I finally got sober and I'm sober 33 years. Oh, congratulations. Yes. But I had to do a lot of work. I had to do a lot of counseling and soul searching because I was self-medicating and I had to find out what was I self-medicating? What was that hole? Um, in your case, there's a lot of similar things. I relate to you, Annie. What, what would you like to tell um, my audience about you before we talk about the book? Tell us who you are. Okay, well... The book has two dogs on it, so people erroneously think it's a book about dogs. Yes. But it's really a book about coping with depression, coping with parental abuse, and most importantly, trying to break the cycle, the generational trauma, and be a good mother to my three boys. I mean, when when I had them, I had no I I basically I grew up in a cult. From the outside, my family looked like a really wonderful middle class Jewish family. My mother was a beloved high school guidance counselor. My father was a brilliant scientist researcher who worked at Tufts Medical School. So from the outside, it, it, we just looked, I don't want to say normal, but you know, it was like a very nice family. My mother was by a patient, they didn't have friends, but if a relative came over for a stray relative for a holiday, they would just sort of look at us like we were, you know, what a nice family. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, and I'll start with my father. My father was only 99% evil. He was emotionally and physically abusive. Uh, um, he, you know, he would pull my hair. When I was seven, he threw my beloved puppy beagle down the stair, basement stairs for peeing on the carpet and killed uh, him. And but no one ever talked about it. No one, you know, I don't know. It was a few days before I realized he'd been killed. And I... I love this little dog. I was seven and it was the one warm, loving thing I had in my family. Oh, yeah. And at dinner table, and remember, this is the good parent. At dinner every night, he would say to me, you can listen, but don't speak. If I ever dared to speak to him outside of dinner, he'd say, look, you have nothing interesting to say. I don't want to talk to you. He said that to me as an adult. When I was 12, I asked him for a ride to a friend's house and he said, make believe I'm dead. So, and he was the good parent. He was the good one. Oh, wow. Good one. Because you know what? With him, if we didn't bother, if my sisters and I didn't bother him, and it was mostly me, I was the oldest. If I didn't bother him, he didn't, he wanted to just do his work. He worked all the time. He sat at the table with his paper and his slide roll. I mean, that was what he did. My mother, she is, I didn't, she was what you call a dark triad. She was Machiavellian narcissistic and sociopathic. Oh my gosh. Very, very smart. She could make anyone do anything. When I was, when, 
When I was three, though, she told me I was self-centered and I had to start washing my own clothes. From my earliest memory, she used to say, you know, I was only 22 when you were born. I didn't want to have you. I had other things I wanted to do. When I was 11, she told me if I didn't marry someone Jewish, she'd disown me. I was 11. I didn't really know what disown meant, but I could tell from her voice it wasn't good. And I would just imagine myself floating alone in a dark outer, outer space. Then when I was 25 and I married a Jewish man, she came into the bathroom during the wedding reception and told me that her best friend, who hadn't bothered to come to the wedding that was a mile from her house, that her best friend had told her that my marriage would never last. But I loved my parents and I respected them. And they, my mother just kept setting these things for me to do. And I, and for example, when she told me what her friend said, I just thought, I, I didn't, first of all, now I realize her friend didn't say that. She just made that up. But it didn't occur to me that even if her friend did say it, she would have told me that. But, you know, I was so in love with my mother that I just smiled at her because, you know, what did I care what her friend, I mean, I yeah. just loved these parents so much. And I just kept wishing and wishing and hoping that if I did everything she told me to do, someday they would love and accept me. And yeah. she sent me off to Israel when I was 16. She was really into my being Jewish. And it was just uh, this indoctrination. And I ended up go. I didn't want to go. I was going to be so homesick. But I went for eight weeks. I was on a kibbutz. And I was the only one who I had gone to Hebrew school my whole life. That's what she made me do after school. Every day I had to go to Hebrew school. I couldn't do activities. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, it was like I was I knew more he, on the kibbutz. I was the only one who spoke English and a little Hebrew. And I became like this go to person. I made friends. For I, eight, I didn't realize this was the me I could have been, and so I was, you liked it there. You oh my liked God! It. I didn't realize I didn't realize that at home I was just trudging along, trying, just hoping I could do what they want. You know, I didn't realize that that wasn't normal. And then when I was in Israel for two months, and I mean, I just blossomed, and I had, and I got this boyfriend who spoke no English, so I had to. It, I mean, my I was so fluent in Hebrew, so I came home. I was so excited. I had done two things she wanted, gone to Israel, and I found a Jewish boyfriend. There you go. Car, they picked me up at the airport. I'm so excited. I forget that I'm not supposed to speak. And for two two hours on the way home, I'm just going on and on about my vacation. And my, it wasn't my kibbutz. I get home and she just, she was just being really mean to me. And she wouldn't talk to me. She was really angry at me, but she didn't tell me why. So for two weeks, I just lay face down on the bed and sobbed until school started. Okay, oh. then I'm sitting on my, on my bed doing homework a few months later, and my father appears in the doorway. My father never, he would never see. He oh. goes, and your mother just told me you aren't taking math this year. If you don't make up for this, your life won't be worth living. And, I, you know, he signed the thing. So he said, this summer, you'll take calculus in summer school. And if you want us to pay for college, you go to Tufts and major in chemical engineering. And I just looked at him. I said, Dad, I'm supposed to go to Israel. He goes, you're not going. Your mother doesn't want you writing letters to that boyfriend. And then I said, but Dad, I've never gotten above a C in math or science. He said, your mother and I are older. We know better. This is what you're doing. And I just wanted them to love me. So I went. I took calculus. I started chemical engineering. Each semester, I'd go to the library, open the textbook, and say to myself, you can do this. But by the middle of the page, my mind was numb. I managed. There were only four girls in the class. I was in, out of 24. I was way at the bottom. No one worried that I was going to knock them off with, you know, an A. So everyone was willing to help me. we do labs. I would write up the reports. They would do the, the messy work. And the end of senior year, I went to the registrar to see if I had actually passed my courses and would be able to graduate. And I had, and I couldn't wait to tell my parents. And I go running to the phone booth, put in my dime, and I call my father. I'm like, dad, I did it. I passed my courses, I'm graduating. I am a chemical engineer. And uncharacteristically, he chuckled. And then he said, now I can write that article for Science Magazine about teaching a monkey 
to be a chemical engineer. Oh my God. I just felt like someone had kicked me in the stomach and I just leaned against the back of the, of the phone booth to keep myself from collapsing on the dirty floor. I mean, say it as if he was joking. No, it was like a real thing. It was was really, he didn't, it was mean. He was, that's, that's the thing about my father. He had this mean streak. So even if he had nothing, sometimes he would, out of the blue, he would just say something mean, just mean. I don't understand, but I don't understand uh, growing up in an alcoholic home with an alcoholic father and a cold, distant mother who never kissed or hugged her children. I don't understand how you could love them. Well, first of all, when you're abused and you're in this cult, you don't realize you don't, I kept thinking, I just, I just needed to do something. I just needed to do this. I just needed, to, and then I got married. I married the Jewish man. We had three sons. I mean, he two went to Harvard on their, you know, they just, what, it was nothing. I was telling you, what, what cult? What cult was this? They were the cult. My mother was this, yeah. and her, you know, and the inside, they were just, another thing, My and again, as someone who's sociopathic and, smart and so psychologically savvy. When I was a little girl, every day I'd come home from school and she'd come home from school and she'd sit down and she would talk to me and we would talk and she'd ask me about school. And she had she had this way of looking, she could do this to anyone when she wanted. You just felt there was no one more important in the world to her than you. And she did this and it, it was a wonderful feeling. And as I got older, as when I got, she just stopped doing it, but I still kept trying to, it was like she made me into, it was a drug and she had, I was addicted to that drug. And I mean, it's not so bad for a girl to want her mother to look at her like she matters. I mean, that's not, there's nothing really wrong with that. And I'll just say this, when my father was 60 and my mother was in her fifties, the year month I got married, they took out a $10,000 loan and they started this biotech company. It was just my father part-time and my mother took a sabbatical from her guidance, being a guidance counselor. This was a test for dairy, for dairy plants to use. So my mother got a notebook put out by the Dairy Association with every dairy plant in the country. And she just started with the first one. And, and she would, she just has this, she was a great listener and she would talk to the plant manager or the, whoever it was that was in charge and she would find out about their families and I mean she would she could sell anything to anyone well that company I mean we, to me my father's brilliant ideas and her her sales ability I mean there's 500 you know they're dead now but it ended up having 500 people in this company I, I don't even know you know I'm not involved but they were like a dynamic duo on one level and then they were just these really horrible you know, horrible, horrible people. Now, another thing I I related to was um, growing up, my father never wanted us to have a dog. And my my brother wanted a dog very badly. And um, did you mention, I'm trying to think from your book in the beginning, did did you have pets when you were young? Well, that was, my father brought one home from a lab next door to him. That was the beagle puppy that he ended up throwing down the stairs. That's and killed, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And after that, no more. Um, I think he brought another one home, but then when I was, at, they sent me off to date some camp overnight camp and they told me they had put him, given him to a family in a farm or something. Oh which my really gosh. I mean, the similarities um, with our childhoods, but so let me ask you about that. So now, when you um, got married and got your own home, did you get a animal right away? Did you get a dog? Uh, what? No, and that's like the whole, that's why there's a book because okay. my middle son, when he was born, his first, I think he was already wanting a dog when he came into this world, but his first word was dog. And his first complete sentence was, I want a dog. And I did not want a dog. Besides, who knows what was in the back of my mind with this well, dog. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, it wasn't until I wrote, wrote this book that it all came, but you know, you have three kids, you're working. You, who, who do you think does the work for a dog, right? Oh, every time. 
Okay. Of course. Oh, mommy, I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll walk it. Oh, we'll walk it. It's cold outside. No problem. Well, no problem. So for 10 years, we got gerbils and hamsters. You name it, we had it. And then for his avoid the dog, right? Yes. And for his 10th birthday, I, right before his 10th birthday, I see an ad in the paper, uh, a headline, African hedgehog, the perfect pet. So I say, Joseph, all right. So I call to get directions. And the man says, well, you know, it's really a porcupine and you need to wear rubber gloves to handle it. So I just hung up the phone. We had enough of these these creatures and it, it was substitutes time yeah and so and i want you to know i don't shop for anything i mean mm -hmm. we moved cities i looked at three houses and bought one i'm not a shopper good mm -hmm. enough is good like you were saying earlier good enough is good enough mm -hmm. when it came to the dog i needed better than good enough so i got a book with every breed a you know 450 mm -hmm. pages and then one day my son came, another son came home. He had just been at someone's house. They had a wheat and terrier. I looked it up in the book. It did everything but empty the dishwasher. So this oh, was this sounds our, like, yeah. and all the breeder. It's January. I call her. She goes, okay, we'll put you on a list. We're having litter in May. And I'm like, oh my God, sometimes it is so easy to be a good mother. It's January. May is a lifetime away. And I'm a good mother. Everybody's happy. There's no dog. Four days later on Thursday, she calls up and says, we have this 10 month old we, uh, dog, Maddie. We were gonna use her for a show dog, let her next too long. If you come out this weekend and we meet your kids and blah, 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 you can take her home this weekend. And uh, like, I could just not tell my kids. I could, you know, I could have done any. Mm -hmm. But I said, okay. And yeah. One day we went out to get the dog before we got in the car. I, everyone got in the car. I just walked through my house looking at it, thinking it will never look like this again. And I was in, I suffered with depression driving out there. I don't even know what they were talking Not about. Not surprising that you suffer with depression. Yeah. You probably chronic anxiety disorder. No, I don't have anxiety. Well, oh, that's I, wonderful. You, you lucked out on that one. Uh, I've had ECT, three regimens. I've been inpatient twice. I've been, oh. I've been around the block here. But yeah. anyhow, we get to the breeder. They bring us in the family room. They meet the kids and, uh, and they go, okay, go go in the kitchen. We'll send Maddie up. And I'm just standing there pretty catatonic. And all of a sudden, this white ball of fluff comes bounding into the kitchen. She runs around the family in this a circle around us. And then she lands at my feet. I collapse with my arms around her. And I am absolutely in love you're in love with the dog yeah but let me just tell you the coda to this is we get home the phone's ringing it's my mother she of knew course. i was getting the dog she knew i didn't want the dog i'm like oh no it's great and i told her some stories about the kids and she's like you know oh i bet the boys don't like a little dog like that i'm like no they're so happy now my youngest son was five josh i'm like oh. and you know, I, and I was, I forgot to like be guarded with her. I was just so happy that the dog thing was working and I'm just gushing, which is when she really goes in for the kill. And I forgot to, I forgot to guard myself. And then I said, yeah, this is, this is really going to work out. And she, there's a pause. And then she says, then Josh will go to college and the dog will die. And I did the arithmetic. And she was pretty right. You know, Josh was five or six. And I have an even better story to finish this. Yeah, yeah. But anyhow, every night I got into bed, looked at Maddie by my feet, and her days were numbered. And but you then, didn't know that her days were numbered. No, but you know, my mother had already put a final, like when Josh went to college. Your head. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I was just, I just had, you know, that's the thing. Whatever she said, it just, and, and she yeah. was, Smart. So she'd always sort of know that, you know, she would say something that was true and mean. So that if it weren't true, it wouldn't be so mean. Anyhow, um, seven years later, okay. I and I let Maddie out in the backyard. I still have my coat on when the doorbell rings. It's the UPS man. He says, I'm sorry, ma'am. I just hit your dog and killed her. Uh -huh. And that was Maddie. And that's why the next day I was getting, but wait, you know what that man was delivering? We found out, you know, he was delivering a bar mitzvah present from my mother and father to Josh. Josh's bar mitzvah was in a few weeks. So my mother's, pre and then my son was in school in Boston, my oldest, 
she took them out to dinner. She took them out to dinner with friends at the end of the school year. And gleefully, because she loved being a center of attention, she told everyone at the table the whole story and how her present had been the cause of this dog's death. And she said it like, my son came wow. home, he was crushed. So that's my mother. That's some of them. And she was, but she was, you know, she was a brilliant woman. But she was a narcissist and obviously mentally ill to be the way she was. So, so you lose Maddie. Maddie is the name of the dog, right? And, and everybody look up her book and I will have notes at the end 